Hey, can we talk about Minkowski space for a minute? Minkowski space. It's um, pseudo Euclidean space uh, with like R one comma n, where the one represents time <laughs> from a physicist point of view, and the n represents n spatial dimensions. We've been talking about pseudo Euclidean space, so I thought it'd be fair game. Um, the inner product you might recall looks something like this. Uh, say for some vector v, v dot itself is minus t squared plus x squared plus y squared plus z squared. And if you have more than three dimensions, you just keep adding on more. And that minus sign causes all the trouble because the inner product is not positive definite, which means there are non-trivial vectors that have zero norm. Mathematicians call those vectors null vectors for perhaps obvious reasons, but physicists Physicists will call these vectors light-like vectors because uh, you can use them to model photons, particles of light, things that travel at the speed of light. That's kind of the whole special relativity thing. Uh, in case it wasn't clear, I've set the speed of light to one for this discussion. We just absorb it into the definition of the coordinate t, or if you like, you can choose ta units for time, like seconds, and units for space, like you know x, y, and z. Instead of meters, you can choose, you know, light seconds, and then it's all just natural. Here's a fun fact, not that light beams are sentient by any means, but they don't really experience time the way that we do. From their perspective, everything is instantaneous, at least everything that can be. If that confuses you, just take, uh, you know, some typical time-like vector that would normally experience time, like, you know, something that represents you or me, uh, and then boost, that is to say, do one of those SO1,3 transformations that rotates uh, between time and space direction and see what happens to your sense of time. It slows way down, way down the faster you go. Relative to someone else, of course, this is relativity after all. I mentioned this not because I want to talk about physics or photons or whatever. Uh, I actually want to talk about conformal geometry. And as it turns out, null vectors are really useful in conformal geometry. Can you guess why? Yeah, because anything times zero is zero. <laughs> but in particular, we're going to be interested in the set of null vectors of Minkowski space of this R1, n. And that is precisely defined to be a cone. A cone with like, it's an algebraic variety, whatever, there's a little singularity at the origin, you know, x, y, z, t equals zero. Um, but other than that, at fixed moments in time, you're looking at a sphere centered at the origin whose radius is given by time. Moving forward in the light cone, forward in the light cone is much easier to understand. It's like the photons that left uh, the origin at time t equals zero are expanding out. The backwards light cone, the backwards light cone is also a thing. Uh, it's a little bit less intuitive to think about in terms of photons, but you can think of it as a set of all possible places that photons could be such that they arrive at the origin uh, at time t equals zero. So uh, if that freaks you out, just kind of do the involution, uh, send t equal to minus t, and just flow the thing backwards in, in time. Look at those crazy clouds. And look at the wind blowing over the sawtooth range. Yeah, it's gonna snow tonight. Okay, well, hopefully that um, photon sphere analogy um, didn't give away the game completely, but I, I think it might have. <laughs> We're interested in studying conformal structures on things, manifolds specifically, and in particular, we can think about the conformal structure of the sphere. So basically, that's all that is is an equivalence class of matri met metrics, uh, in this case, the round metric on the sphere, that are related by uh, conformal transformation. Right, so just some factor uh, out in front, say lambda. The light cone, you know, the subset of all zero vectors in, let's say that with t greater than zero, uh, in R1 comma three, gives us a really nice example of a conformal structure on the sphere because uh, time just is this linear, nice, beautiful scaling for the sphere. The sphere just grows with time. Cool. Um, why do we care?
we care because we're interested in studying conformal transformations in Euclidean space, say Rn. Uh, and so let's take R2 as an example. You all know that sometimes it's fun to, to compact R2 into uh, the sphere, right? It's really useful for a lot of purposes. Uh, and we can do that with, a, with you know, one point and we, the inverse, if you like, of the stereographic projection, which is fun, obviously. But what's interesting here is the light cone is a, is a conformal structure for, for the sphere, uh, the two sphere, which means that it also represents the conformal structure of R2. What? Well, as we've just argued, right? The light cone uh, encodes the conformal structure of the two-sphere, and by uh, a diffeomorphism, we can talk about R2 as the plane. So that's one interesting fact, but, but really what we uh, want to point out is that R1,3, the light cone in R1,3, uh, the, whole, the whole damn thing is invariant under SO1,3, or SO1,N for however many dimensions that you want to consider. That's the problem with living in a valley. You can hear the sirens no matter where you are. What I'm trying to say is that SO1,3, the group of isometries, linear isometries uh, in Minkowski space, is, literally is, the group of conformal transformations um, in R2, or on the sphere, however you want to think about it. To prove that, the first thing you probably, well, to prove that it's kind of best done by example, or at least best done explicitly. But uh, if you want to get started, remember we talked about the conformal isometries of R2 and there being six of them? Well, how many generators are there in R1, 3? Six, right? Because you can rotate T with X, T with Y, T with Z, or X with Y and X with Z, Y with Z, right? Six. And how many conformal transformations are there in R2? Two translations, right? <laughs> Things that are uh, depend on X to the zero. Uh, one scale and one rotation, so that's two things that depend linearly on x, and of course the two special conformal transformations, so two, 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 six. Not an accident. Looking at the explicit map between SO1, 3 and the conformal group on R2 uh, is probably best done at home, whether there's a blackboard or, or a chalkboard or even just pens and paper, just because there's a lot of writing involved because there's a lot of computations. Um, but so we'll do that in another video. But I just wanted to bring that to your attention now. Um, also, since we're here, let's do one other quick calculation. We arrived at this kind of uh, line bundle almost over the sphere, right? The conformal structure of the sphere by considering the light cone in R1, 3 uh, and then taking uh, what is it, time-like or space-like hypersurfaces? Uh, hypersurfaces of fixed time, just like conic sections, right? We just uh, cut the top off and that's how we got spheres. Um, but there's another kind of conic, light conic section uh, that we can take. T and Z should be proportional, but they should not cross through that singularity in the light cone at the origin. So let's say T equals Z plus one. All right, take that slice through the light cone, what do you get? Well, it's a short little calculation, right? So you take the line element, minus t squared plus xy squared, blah, 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 replace, uh, well, you know, that whole thing has got to equal to zero because we're on the light cone. Take that t squared, throw it on the other side, so now we've got a nice kind of reasonable thing to work with. Now replace t squared with uh, z plus one whole quantity squared, and what do you see? Right, we can cancel the z squareds and we're left with a paraboloid. C is equal to one half quantity x squared plus y squared minus one. Now you can show that that's essentially diffeomorphic to the plane to R2 by itself. There's lots of ways to do that. The most obvious thing you can do is just project straight down, do a projection, a, a simple projection, a trivial projection just down to the plane, which is totally allowed because there's no what? Why is that not allowed with the sphere, but allowed in this case? Because there's no North Pole. It's a paraboloid. But if that doesn't convince you, another thing that you can do is do the stereographic projection from those spheres we talked about earlier. Instead of onto the plane, you can project down onto this surface, this paraboloid, and then look at the induced metric. And you know what you're gonna see? It's flat. <laughs> it's flat, it's just uh, x squared plus y squared, no big deal. So now the last thing that we should probably do is show that any point on the light cone, you know, any vector on the light cone can be found inside one of these slices, right? So how do we do that? Well, um, let's take a parameter C uh, and have T equals Z plus C. First, let's, let's figure out what the paraboloid is. So that's just uh, 
z is equal to what? 1 over 2c times quantity x squared plus y squared minus c squared. Good. Um, so clearly x squared plus y, you know, doesn't matter. Anywhere on the plane xy squared is going to be involved in this parabola. So that's not an issue. What's an issue is we want to make sure that we have every single point uh, on the upper part of the light cone um, that includes a value of t and a value of x, or excuse me, z, let's say z naught. Uh, and how do we connect those two? Well, yeah, you just take c equal to be the, di the difference, the length of that vector that connects those two points. Boring. That represents a point on the light cone, right? Somewhere in the light cone, z and t. So for a fixed time, you pick that, that choice z. Uh, and so then you just take the slice pff, right there. Um, so you're guaranteed to have that, that particular position. Easy. So what, are this, uh, what does this foliation of, of um, paraboloids look like? Well, it's going to be really hard to draw, <laughs> but I'll give you a couple, right? So it's just a, from very narrow uh, to ever widening, broadening out. Uh, paraboloid, which will eventually go to the plane for large enough value of c, although let's not really discuss that too much, shall we? I should caution that that picture is not exactly right, despite how appealing it is to our three-dimensional sentient sensibilities. <laughs> um, in reality, what you should think of is a little ring starting at a point, say, uh, you know, at time t equals zero, at z equals one, and expanding forward, going up in z, and getting bigger and bigger and bigger uh, with time. So it's a video, a movie, if you like. Uh, and that's why it's a still a two-dimensional surface, um, only if we kind of think of it as a movie moving forward. Uh, kind of like a, like, a, like a bubble ring that a, a diver might emit out. Okay, well, that's enough for today. We're going to go run home before the sun sets. Um, hope you all are having a great time. Next time, we will do the explicit conformal transformations on R2 in terms of mapping from the plane to the sphere to the light cone, do some transformations, come back to the sphere, go back to the plane. Cool. All right, see you then.